professional development services for schools. So we, I'm, I'm a teacher, my, my background is a teacher and deputy principal. I actually wonder if turning the lights off might be better just to really ensure that we can see the slides. It's just like the movies. <laughs> you want to see you. Is that all right? It's probably, even if you can't, it's probably not such so good. good. Um, but as long as you can see these slides, because there's some pretty crucial stuff coming up. Um, so what we do, my background as a teacher, I'm, I'm a, a primary trained secondary English and history teacher, so I've worked across the spectrum. Prior to joining core, I was deputy principal at a new school up in Auckland, Albany Senior High School, one of those schools that Tracy was talking about. Um, one of those brand new flash schools where everything is amazing. Um, and what I do now is work with the other 2,500 New Zealand schools. I also design help architects to design new schools. But the majority of the work that I'm interested in, as Tracy alluded to, is actually just saying having a bunch, a handful of amazing state of the art brand new schools is helpful. But there's another two and a half thousand New Zealand schools that are working their way through this process to make sure that the education they're providing is the education that your kids need, so that we've got really clear alignment around that. So I'm lucky enough to research the, the big trends that are taking, pl taking place in the world. Um, in, the, in the workplace, in the community, globally, but also around education. And I bring that research to, to schools. I'm currently in my spare time, completing my PhD at the University of Melbourne on uh, in modern learning environments, the kind of spaces that we need to, to support um, this vision for future focused education, and um, the, particularly the change leadership that, that needs to be in place around that. So how do we, um, how do we support schools leadership teams, boards of trustees, communities, through the process of, um, of embarking on some fairly significant change. What we're talking about is a very different education system from the one that many of us certainly may have experienced when we were going through. But as Tracy said, the world's changed. And so if we're still doing that, then the world's moved on and we're probably out of step. So one of the things I want to do, three things today, um, talk about some of the drivers of change, those big trends that are taking place. You'll see them daily in your um, just to unpack a little bit of, of uh, some of the implications for those big changes, uh, what I also want to do is talk about the links between well, what we know about pedagogy. Pedagogy is a P word, um, the science of teaching. If, if you want to teach in the most effective way possible, what are the strategies that you use for a particular curriculum purpose? Um, we know a lot more about pedagogy than we did 10 or 15 years ago, and some of it's quite surprising. Some of it's actually diametrically opposed to the sort of experience that we had when we were in school. Uh, and also to give you some, just some quick um, case studies of things that schools are doing in order to be able to, um, to, to mesh these two together. And then as Tracy said, we'll have some Q&A at the end. What's interesting, what's challenging, what's thought provoking, we'll, um, as much as possible, um, try to address some of those questions, but also, most importantly, these questions will drive the ongoing conversation that the school has with you as a community. If one of the things you're interested in hearing more about, recognising this one-off evening is helpful, but it's not the full conversation. There's a lot more to be done. So, let's go. Fast and furious. Um, we might need the light supper for a little, have a little support group at the end um, when we go to the disruption that's taking place in our world. Let's start with something comfortable and familiar. These four things, what do they have in common? The newspaper, print newspaper, cinema, fixed line TV, and DVD or video rental. They're all dying. dying. They're all increasingly obsolete. These are listed as being some of the riskiest industries to be involved in worldwide. Is anybody involved in these industries? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. So, uh, newspaper, it's been you know, the, the cornerstone of an informed democracy for hundreds of years and um, is in, in serious disruption at the moment under really serious um, challenge. Why? Because Advertising revenue looks like that. Through the second half of the 20th century, steady tracking up, and then something happens, something here, that means that advertisers just disappear from newspapers. The rivers of gold, all those, those um, classifieds, all those kinds of things. What has, what's disrupted that revenue or business model? The internet. The internet, mm -hmm. and in particular mobile internet. I actually read newspaper more than I've ever read it before. We, I love the newspaper, we get it delivered on Sunday and read it, have a cup of coffee, all that sort of stuff. The rest of the time, I bring my information, my media on the go, and I do it on a mobile device. I certainly don't pay anyone for the privilege of doing that. I pay with my eyeballs and look at some ads. But the, the, the business model of me passing money over to get my news 
is actually broken. It's, it's, it's unsustainable. And so one of the newspapers are doing at the moment is trying to find what the new business model is. When you think about 200 years, 300 years, newspapers being produced, if we think about how quickly that disruption has happened, if we think about 2000, really after that, mobile devices, what we're really doing is talking about smartphones and iPads. We're talking about between five and 10 years that that disruption is taking place for that 200 year old business model. DVD and video rentals are the same. You don't need the disc anymore to go and do <coughs> the stuff. Netflix launched last month, the month before in New Zealand, when you pay $12.99 and you get all you can eat, binge watch, any series that's just about ever been produced. Our equivalent of video we see is Blockbuster in the States. And in 2004, it was a $6 billion company. By 2010, it was bankrupt. And we see the rise of this red line, which is Netflix. So there's Hulu, there's Lightbox, there's Eaglu, there's all those different on-demand consumption things that weren't possible prior to low-cost, affordable, mobile, connected devices being in most people's homes, if not in their pockets. Again, a very, very short time frame that's indicative of the kind of disruption that's taking place at the moment. This is the stuff that you'll see daily. If we're not careful, historically, these, these four things have also been about moving information from one place to another. So a journalist has a story, they use the print medium to get it out to us as an audience, or the phone line, or whatever it is. Historically, schools have done that as well. What we've done is move stuff from people's brains, teachers' brains, educated people, into the next generation. So moving information from one place to another. And if we're not careful, schools can be right in the centre here as well. If we just focus on lining kids up, facing the front, writing stuff on whiteboards or you know, putting them up on a data projector and getting them to copy down and memorising it, we're going to be just as obsolete as, as these industries. And thankfully, not much of that happens anymore in New Zealand. We've kind of moved on from that transmission model of education. The, um, the fact remains that I can get access to just about any learning I want from just about anywhere. I can learn via my mobile phone, I can learn um, on, an, on an iPad, on a laptop, I can be in the bus, the public library, a cafe, they're all potential learning opportunities. I no longer need to go to school to get learning. And so that's really challenging for us. I'm particularly committed to, to schools because I'm a teacher. I quite like them. I think they have value. But what we're rapidly trying to work out what their new value is in this changed landscape. And this is the heart of future-focused education. What is education if it looks forward and anticipates the challenges that our kids are going to face, rather than just honouring the stuff that we've historically done in the past, just doing more of that but better. So there's a and teachers, the teachers in this school, other down the country, across the world, are rapidly trying to get our heads around what it is that we offer in this new, in this new landscape. The, what, what is this? If you've got good eyes, you can probably read what it is. It's a Google car. Google. It's, it's not the Max car. Down here, it says self driving car. It's literally a car that drives itself. Have you seen that? So there's a, there's a person in this car, but the, a computer is operating this vehicle. All of these different things that look like it's a Max car is a, are sensors that tell the computer exactly where the car is on the road, whether it's straight towards the centre line or whether there's a parked car coming up, whether that traffic light is green or red, you know, reasonably important information. And the computer is making decisions about driving that car constantly. The human being's just in there for the ride, basically. This is, the, these are real, this is not science fiction. There are, we've got dozens and dozens of these producing their own cars now rather than using these hybrid predecessors. So they're actually building their own robot cars. It's legal to operate a self-driving car in Japan, in um, Germany, and also in California, where this photo was taken. It will be legal, Simon Bridget said that um, he's beginning the process of um, legislating to allow self-driving vehicles um, in New Zealand. So these have been going for a few years. Google have been investing in them. Um, and they're, they're quite extraordinary cars. The, just only a few years ago, years ago, 10 years ago, we would think that no computer could possibly cope with this amount of data and, and actually be better at a human being at driving. We thought driving was a uniquely human thing. We were so clever at driving and do all that sort of stuff.
change the stereo and indicator and all that complicated stuff, a computer would flash up with death and you know crash or need a reboot or something. But these are far, far better than humans at driving. The Google and this fleet of self-driving cars have clocked up over a million kilometers on the roads of Southern California. It's littered with, of, littered with photos of people just taking photos, presumably while they're driving, of the self-driving cars with nobody in them just cruising along the freeway. And in those million of kilometers, there have only been two accidents, so a very, very low accident rate. But both of those accidents were caused by human beings not paying attention driving into the self-driving car. The self-driving cars have never actually caused an accident. They're far, far safer than we are. We are the danger on the roads. Inattention, fatigue, type. these things can just go and go and go. So there's another example of things that we historically have taken for granted. These <coughs> people are talking about these being commercially available within the next two years. I can't wait. I spent three hours in the car driving down this morning, and I could have been sleeping, or I could have been, um, I could have been you know, doing emails or doing more work or watching Netflix or whatever it was, talking to my friends, eating breakfast, you name it. Can't wait. But Google haven't invested in these to make my life easier or safer to lower the road toll, although that is actually what's going to happen. They've invested in these because these are going to make Google billions and billions and billions of dollars. This is a significantly disruptive technology that they're all over. How are they going to make billions of dollars? The first industry that they're going after is the taxi industry. And so you go to the airport, whatever it is, open the door, climb in, swipe the card, or even just tap and go, to say we want to go and the car will drive you. Google already has those components. They've got the self-driving car, they've got um, speech to text, they've got wireless technology, they own maps, they've got everything that's all ready to go. And so we start to unpack the implications of something like this, and we think, I've got a, I've got a boy, William, he's just out of school, he's five years old. What's the world going to be like when Will gets out of school in 13 years' time? What are the jobs going to be that we take for granted now, taxi driver, that are no longer going to, going to exist in two, three, four, five, ten years' time, let alone 13 years' time? So Will doesn't have a burning desire to be a taxi driver, but if he did, he probably wouldn't even get a chance because those things won't exist. And so as Tracy said, the jobs, it's, it's such a cliche to say that we're preparing kids for jobs that don't yet exist. We also have to be careful that we are not preparing them for jobs that will no longer exist. So that's the big challenge. Anything that can be like driving, with the car to gear, accelerate, like all that sort of stuff, computers are actually really, really good at. The big, the big driver behind this, the, the disruptive um, theory, is a thing called Moore's Law. This year is the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. Moore was a computer scientist, worked for Intel, one of the founders of Intel, and he noticed that the power of computer chips was doubling very, very quickly. And, and he proposed his law that every two years the power of a computer chip will, will double. So if you've got $1,000 and you go to Dick Smith, the computer you can buy two years from now will be twice as powerful, twice as much RAM, twice as much hard drive as the one you could buy now. And that's to, to be true. just how quickly it would happen. So in addition to doubling every two years, the price was halving. And so Moore's law is literally the power of computers doubles every 12 months. 12 months, doubling, 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 doubling. And so since 1965, when Moore proposes law, it's been a billion-fold increase in the power of computer chips. And that gives rise to things that even a few years ago were science fiction. Driving themselves, that's out of the Jetsons. And now it's possible because doubling, 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 doubling. So we extrapolate Moore's law out. By the time William gets to leave school, doubling, 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 doubling. It's not just taxi drivers that are going to be a, a threatened species. It's a whole bunch of other things as well. So what are those jobs that are threatened? Right. This is the bit we might need a bit of counselling. And more than a light sum, we might need a drop of whiskey at the end. Right? So these, this is... Um, an Oxford University study that looked at how susceptible jobs were to computerization. So basically, can a smartphone app or a computer, a shiny box, do your job over the next 10 to 15 years? 
will you be made redundant because of a computer being able to do your job better than you can? So these are the different, this is US data, our economy is very similar in structure. These are the different sectors of the economy, you can read them. What I want you to do is to work out which of those is most vulnerable to job loss through computerization over the next 10 to 15 years. I'll give you a clue, they're all susceptible, but which ones are most susceptible? Take a minute or two to talk to the people around you. See if you can come up with, with the ones that are most susceptible. three that are particularly vulnerable to job loss through computerization. Anyone want to guess what they are? Office and admin? Office and admin is one of the big three. Yes. Production? Um, production is vulnerable, but most of the jobs have been lost in production already. We've hollowed out our factories over the last 30 or 40 years, and so a few jobs that remain are particularly vulnerable, but most of those jobs are gone. As a proportion of the total employed workforce, it's actually quite low. Transportation, I did see you up for that one. Again, as a proportion of the total economy, it's actually quite low. But if something's, like, you think about long distance truck driving, I would far rather have a robot that doesn't need a reboot doing that stuff than a tired person on that 18 wheeler coming to work. Um, because those things work 24 hours. And, you know, we, can, we know that if something's going wrong, we can actually stop that machine where we don't know. Anyway, yeah. So, um, Office and Edmund is one of the big three. What are the other two? Sales. Sales. Sales is one of the big three. Yep. No, no. Construction, no. Does the financial side of it come into like sort of zero and counting packages and? Yeah, kind of. It's management, business, and financial, but it's also the other third one, which is the service sector, because historically we've got people to do a whole bunch of stuff that zero now does for us. The number crunching and the data analysis. So if you think about being an accountant in the 1950s and 60s, it was primarily transactional. Add up numbers and you kind of do stuff with it. The, the last sort of 5% was making some recommendations on where the business should go. Now, computers do a whole bunch of that number crunching, and 95% is the analysis and the interpretation and the problem solving that goes with it. So, let me show you this graph. Zero means it's almost impossible for a computer to do your job in the next 10 to 15 years. One means it's almost inevitable that a computer will do your job in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, service sector, sales, office and admin. Those are the big blobs of colour there that represent a significant proportion of the workforce. This is from 2013, so this is already happening. Has anybody ever bought anything on the internet? <laughs> now, right? You're contributing to this. That's sales reps being done out of a job. 
the, I mean, the, the internet's changed the whole nature of business. So we can connect ourselves with suppliers as consumers, and we just get the stuff. We don't need middlemen. We don't need people along the chain. But you'll notice that that doesn't mean that there's nobody going to be involved in sales, because even with that big blob of red there, there's still a big chunk of red that comes through here. So you will be involved in sales. There will be fewer people, but they'll be doing quite a different job. Rather than just connecting a product with a consumer, you'll be doing very different things. You'll be listening, you'll be solving problems with people, you'll be doing really rich and things. Mm -hmm. Service, um, things like uh, travel agents. So historically, you know, if we think back 20 years' time, if you needed to go and get a flight somewhere, not a holiday, just a flight, you'd go to a travel agent. And you get them to do all your foreign exchange as well and get your travellers checks and all that sort of stuff. How do we do that now? Mm -hmm. On the web. We do it online and we've got our cards, tap, what off we go. So, so um, travel agents sort of kind of sitting in the service sector, those kind of accountants that we we're talking about, a lot of those jobs are disappearing. That's not to say there won't be any more travel agents, but they'll be doing a very personalised service, something that you can't get online. The 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 methodology, there's this thing called Moravec's paradox, and it basically says that anything that computers find difficult, we find easy. And anything that computers find easy, we find difficult. Stuff up here, like um, add up a thousand numbers in two seconds. It's hard. I'm, I'm not good at maths, but um, you know, very few of us would be able to do that. For a computer, that's a piece of cake. Whereas down here, there are some things that computers are not very good at we just take for granted, such as interpersonal things. So you meet a person in the street, within half a second you can tell what kind of frame of mind they're in, you know, you're a friend, you can just read all those non-verbal cues, all those kinds of things. Computers are completely befuddled by that stuff, particularly when you do things like start to use sarcasm. You can see the steam pouring out of the computer's ears. So anything that is interpersonal keeps you down here. Anything that requires original problem solving because computers are very good at solving known problems, but they need to be programmed in order to apply a solution to a given set of circumstances. Computers don't program themselves yet. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but the Creative Act, when you're doing, when you're working in computers, is either using the computer as a tool to solve a problem for someone, or you are programming that computer. Computers can't do that stuff on their own yet, and so that's. Interpersonal skills, original problem solving in anything that is creative. <coughs> Computers again, not for creative. Up here, number crunching, algorithms, process, those kinds of things. So the terrifying bit, and the bit that we'll probably all need counselling for, is that this line here is 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is considered, 0 0.7 and above is considered high likelihood of job loss through. 47% relates to the 47% of 47% of the people currently employed in the US who fit into that category. One in two people fits into the category of you are probably going to lose your job to a smartphone app or to a computer over the next 10 years. This is the one for kids to go into. So if we're preparing them for the world that we kind of know now, or even with mental models of what education was like when we went to school, even though, you know, school three or four years ago. <laughs> you know, that kind of world is long gone and it's going to be incredibly disruptive by the time our kids get, get out. So this is the thing, this is the thing that gives me nightmares. This is the thing that challenges me most about what education needs to be. Because if our kids this is this is doubling, 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 this this threat, this challenge is no longer is, is not going to go away. So kids might wake up in 20, 30, 40, 50, and then realise that the job that they love, that gave them meaning and hope and a reason to get out of bed in the morning, is actually better off done by a computer. And they are going to have to retrain and reskill themselves to get out of this space and to get into this space where the new emerging jobs are. So one of the things that we try to do in education is, is to create lifelong learners. It's a lovely catchphrase, lifelong learners. But actually, Without the ability to learn, unlearn, relearn, and be a lifelong learner, you're pretty stuck in this future. And so that really sharpens up and puts some meat on those bones of that fancy catchphrase, lifelong learner. So we're grappling with this. We're really struggling. You know, the type of days of the typing pool, um, the the uh, 
uh, travel agents. My phone has got a little app on it where I just hit record and start talking, and it turns my words into writing, so I can compose you know, letters and emails and whatever else it's in, the way it goes. Historically, what I would have done is send it to someone who would transcribe, you remember dictaphone, it's a little tape recorder, and somebody would have typed it up. The, the smartphone app does that now, and so office and admin, that's the big challenge for them. Robot teachers? Probably not. This is us here, teachers in education, because it's such a rich interpersonal thing. And it is creative work, and it requires original problem solving. What worked for one kid is not necessarily going to work for another. And so if you're waiting for the robot teachers, thankfully, for me, they're probably not going to arrive anytime soon. Arthur C. Clarke said, any teacher who can be replaced by a machine, should be. <laughs> if you're a tall robotic about the way that you're engaging with kids, you have no place <coughs> in the Get out and let people with heart and creativity and imagination go. Right, so that's our kind of jumping off point. Um, so this Foxconn, the consumer electronics factory in China, millions of people involved there. Um, what they want to do at the top there is to replace a million people with a million robots over the next couple of years. So the few jobs that do remain in factories are going as well. Robots are getting smarter and smarter, intelligent, um, artificial intelligence, all that sort of stuff. So if you're in a factory or you're planning just to not do well at school and get a job at a factory, good news for you, that's probably not going to happen. But the really challenging thing is that it's not just people who work in factories. This was in um, the Telegraph last year. This is about some of the most highly paid people in the world working in the city of London. So investment bankers, lawyers, quantitative analysts. And this is their jobs disappearing as well. So um, computers will not only be able to, to undertake complex mathematical equations, but draw logical, nuanced conclusions. When we think about what people do in the city of London and they make decisions about whether a merger should proceed or not, what they have to do is do all sorts of projections into the future. What if the cost of oil halves? What if it doubles? What if there's another financial crisis? What if unemployment drops? What if the pound goes up? It's, it's baffling to think that we entrust those kind of complex calculations to human beings, given all, our, all of our flaws when it comes to doing those high level um, calculations. What's happening now, it's racing away, is machine learning is increasing in, in, in leaps and bounds. So computers are being able to learn from their own calculations. And that is challenging not only factory workers, but also people right across the spectrum. So a big, big challenge. Right. Terrifying enough? Yeah, right, let's move on. Um, in terms of the skills required in the, in the workforce, so this again is a workforce, but it also tracks against the kinds of skills required in society. If we talk about these skills, um, this is historical data, but the latest, I haven't got the latest graph here, but the latest data going right up to 2013 shows exactly the same trend. I've hidden the lines here. You're not going blind. Um, <laughs> complex communication, expert thinking is solving new problems, routine complex is solving non problems, problems where there is an answer in the back of the book, like train loser station, traveling at, or calculate the area of a cylinder, blah, 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 blah. Routine manual is doing something physical over and over again. Non routine manual is doing something physical, but it's different every time. So I hear people talking about. Um, um, Repair and maintenance. Repair is actually one thing that's difficult to automate because things always fail in a slightly different way. It's actually quite a hands-on thing to do. So repair um, <coughs> is into non routine So if we benchmark all of these in 1969 at zero, some of those skills have, have become more important in the economy and some have become less important. So if you want to back a winning horse, you should probably get good at the skills that have become rather than the ones that are becoming accepted. So again, it's probably no surprise for you to learn. This is what's happening. Complex communication and the ability to work in teams and to communicate with a diverse group. To listen as well as talk. Expert thinking is the solving of known of, of problems where there is no known solution. 